Hello, good afternoon. I'm Greg Daffner and I want to welcome everyone to the second APSCC webinar. We call it episode two, India Space Policy, Recent Announcements and Future Expectations. Before we get started, just a kind of a broad overview about who we are, that we're doing this wonderful series of webinars. Um, we are APSCC, and that stands for the Asia Pacific Satellite Communications Council. We are the only Pan-Asian Pure Play Outer Space and Satellite Industry Association. We are a nonprofit international members organization, and we depend on you to provide the goals and leadership for our industry association. So if you are not already a member, please join us. And talking about joining us, we are still planning our annual conference and exhibition, which was um, supposed to be, or is supposed to be, November 9th, uh, 17th through 19th in Manila, the Philippines. But in recognition of the limitations we all face in these times of the pa pandemic, we are becoming less optimistic that we will be able to hold a live event. So in keeping with the policy, hope for the best, the plan for the worst, we are preparing to do an online conference and we will keep you posted on whether we will be able to do that as well as an in-person in conference um, in Manila. We will follow today's webinar with a quick survey poll. So stay tuned, we'll get back to you. As I said, this is APSCC's second webinar and we are aiming for, I believe it's July 9th for our next webinar session, uh, whose topic will be video distribution um, and the role that satellite continues to play. And then shortly thereafter, later in July, we will have another webinar on the uh, China new space um, companies and what they're doing. But first, today's webinar, India Space Policy, Recent Announcements and Future Expectations. Personally, I'm very interested in hearing about the um, regulatory changes in both the structure of the regulatory ecosystem, as well as some of the substantive regulatory opportunities for satellites um, that are projected to occur in the near future in India. Um, and it would be nice if we also hear a little bit about what's going on in terms of some of the uh, space entrepreneurs that are rising in India today. And maybe even a word on the effect that the pandemic is having on our industry in India. Our moderator today is Gagan from NSR. He is a senior, senior analyst and he's based out of Mumbai, India, which is a good place to be for an India webinar. Um, he joined NSR in 2017, but he's been working in the industry for many years and he brings together a unique um, combination of perspective on satellite technology, economics, and finance. Without further ado, take it away, Gagan. Thank you. Thank you so much, Greg, and welcome all. Uh, we have an esteemed panel of uh, panelists here today uh, with Krishna, Raji, and Sadeep. <clears throat> I'll go through the introductions one by one, and then we'll dive right in with some of the pressing questions we have towards India's space policy. First up, Krishna. He's the Vice President and CTO at Hughes Communication India, an industry veteran with over uh, 10 years of experience in India, fighting policy issues and carving a path out uh, towards a uh, new one. Raji has been a distinguished fellow and head Nuclear and Space Policy Initiative of the World Research Foundation. She writes papers on an international benchmark, uh, talking about diplomacy, talking about different policies of various countries, and uh, what to make of them as far as India is concerned. Her, we have Pratip, he's a co-founder and CTO of Spatial, doing incredible things in the space of geospatial analytics and uh, tying them into consumer space. Uh, we'll get to that. Um, in some time on, on those details. Without further ado, uh, I have a few questions. We'll dive right in. Uh, there are three sets of tracks we're going to take. Uh, policy in India affects SATCOM, it affects Earth observation, and it also affects manufacturing and the security part as far as the government is concerned. 
we'll address them one by one and then we'll have a conversation uh, together. So starting off uh, with Krishna. Krishna, I'm going to share my screen and let's go to the presentation. Um, would you be able to take the audience through the state of satellite broadband today, uh, maybe in four or five minutes, and what are the policy changes needed upon the field? Yeah, uh, uh, thanks, Gagan. So uh, welcome, all of you. So a couple of trends that I'm going to uh, I put up here, uh, you know, I just want to uh, just focus on the right uh, topmost uh, of this chart. Uh, so uh, in India, unlike some of the other geographies where the consumer uh, is, you know, is also served through satellite broadband, uh, India doesn't have those uh, services today because primarily because the affordability, uh, you know, especially the CP affordability substantially drops, you know, if you go outside the 200 cities in the country and it is within these 200 cities is the fiber penetration, which has, you know, happened quite a bit. So it is always the businesses that are, you know, the ones which are uh, latching on to the satellite broadband, you know, it could be, and, and the biggest potential I, I feel is comes from uh, the small and medium enterprises who uh, for their day-to-day, -day, you know, conducting of business, you know, needs internet and reliable uh, internet and faster internet. Uh, and they are the ones who really would get onto uh, satellite broadband much more than consumers. But of course, uh, you know, uh, so satellite, you know, has as a, as a uh, means of delivery of broadband, uh, grew very well till 2008, uh, but then the market dynamics changed. You know, the private players on the terrestrial side came into being. Um, and also, you know, if you do a comparison on the pricing, you know, uh, even if you don't understand the, the you know, uh, rupee as a, as a currency, but you, you can still see the ratios with which today a, a 3G, 4G service vis-a-vis -vis an MPLS service and a satellite service, how are we priced? So there's a, a very vast difference in the pricing. So that's reflected in the chart on the right where the revenues of most of the operators, you know, have uh, either plateaued or, you know, or in the decline uh, as we move forward. So that's, that's definitely a cause of concern, uh, which will, which, you know, I'll address ways of, you know, how that, that can be taken care of. And, you know, in, uh, so uh, some of the, you know, uh, regulatory in interventions uh, uh, or lack of, uh, of them have also resulted, uh, uh, Gagan, could you just stay in the uh, previous slide? Yeah, sorry. So one, uh, you know, the, there has been an artificial price increase on the, you know, some of the capacities and more, I'll, I'll explain this, you know, uh, in, in a while. And the, the tax structure is, you know, I, I keep saying this about 50% of, you know, uh, the tax structure is, you know, various, you can name it. It is sometimes called a withholding tax. Sometimes it's called a GST. Sometimes it's called a revenue share. But all of it, it's it's a fifty. You know, it amounts to close to about fifty percent. I don't think any other tax regime. You know, you will see a fifty percent on a satellite broadband. It's not sustainable. Uh, so next slide, please. So with this happening, you know, definitely the industry is recalibrating. I think most of the developed geographies have, you know, uh, have already done this recalibration and India is also recalibrating it. So primarily the satellite is more and more, you know, pushed towards the edge. You know, it's covering the last 10 to 20 percent of the population, uh, you know, in terms of, you know, broadband, uh, you know, for businesses or uh, rural and skill development, those kind of things. Another interesting application which has really caught on and the government is laying a lot of emphasis is on the 3G, 4G backhauls, uh, and of course, which will be followed by 5G, and the you know, Wi-Fi hotspots, which you know, there's a massive plan to deploy Wi-Fi hotspots in the country. And of course, the third thing, which is the natural fit for satellite, which is mobility, uh, the government, you know, uh, announced towards, uh, you know, uh, later part of 2018, you know, they announced this uh, flight and maritime connectivity policy, uh, which allows, you know, uh, uh, connectivity through via satellite, you know, into planes and uh, ships. So that's uh, another area. But it's imperative, you know, that 
rest of the world has all, always been enjoying uh, lower cost of you know capacity so uh, capacity prices definitely have to come down and uh, this is a trend you know what i've shown here and some of that has to really uh, the government has to ensure that you know they happen so that's that's imperative next slide please so uh, this is uh, i i'm building a case for policy intervention uh, why is immediate policy intervention required and what has been the track record so in the year 1999 the government uh, made a policy intervention via this new telecom policy of 1999 of course that you know so definitely the graph grew uh, i mean the uh, you can see the growth happening there then uh, again there was an intervention done uh you know uh, subsequently in the 8 9 period where further liberalization happened again the in industry responded so the message that i want to drive home you know to the uh, you know the people who are policy makers is every time there is a policy intervention the industry responds the consumers respond so uh, definitely everybody is to gain uh, by doing that policy intervention um now you know possibly you know we are in 2020 and uh, so this is again a step where uh, so it could take two paths so it's it could be business as usual if no policy is uh, you know made which means you know the uh, the whole growth curve will plateau and decline after a period of time or if you know certain privatization efforts and opening the skies all all of this happen uh, you know that could be the inflection point so uh, this is you know what we are going to debate uh, further uh, you know uh, so with this uh, next slide please so there are uh, as as the uh, rest of the world there are some key stakeholders of obviously the government itself um, and we have the department of space uh, and we have the service providers you know which are on ground service providers telecom service providers who are licensed to provide services and we have satellite operators so for the government the priority is provide affordable broadband there is a today definitely a set of population which has been left out and you know they they can be covered only by satellite and the government you know very much recognizes that uh, so there are unserved and underserved areas which can be served by satellite now the digital india program envisages a lot of you know digital transformation of a lot of you know g2c services which can all move and and uh in a pandemic like the covid you know so more and more services are you know people are trying to access these services online uh, nobody wants to go uh, uh, you know physically to a government office to get their work done so more and more you know these online things are now uh, talk of the town and you know they need to happen and uh, obviously the government also has the make in india objectives and fdi objectives so th so these are something you know which the government has as, as objectives but we can see from the department of space objectives uh, you know if you see the other you know in comparison with the other three uh, i feel there's a misalignment you know in the objectives of uh, uh, you know department of space in delivering affordable broadband with the with the help of the private industry so obviously there you know they, there was a, a policy called the satcom policy which is made in 90, 99 i mean in 97 first and then revised in 2000 so still the compliance is what their uh, first and uh, you know priority is but private participation they are talking about but you know it is more allowed in you know they are they are trying to bring in private participation in more in launch vehicles and building of satellites but not private participation in uh, providing of satellite services so that's uh, a little sad to hear uh also uh, you know it is the domestic capacity uh, you know Uh, definitely does not uh, uh, is is not sufficient and that has been recognized you know it's uh, by the previous chairman who went on record to say that you know india has a 50% capacity shortage uh, so definitely these you know uh, this capacity needs to be augmented so everybody recognizes that it can't be domestically met now coming to the satellite service providers so first and foremost you know the time bound availability of capacity because we have back to back contracts with customers you know others uh, to whom we have to serve them so now if we talk about you know capacity when we don't know when it will be uh, you know capacity will be available 
or if we have to pay for the capacity from day one, but the approvals are granted about you know 12 months later, it's no good. And the pricing obviously has to be in line with the international benchmarks. Uh, so you know, if there's a benchmark, so and a lot of times this is artificially inflated because of some of the points I'm going to discuss from the satellite operator side. Uh, levies I've already talked about, and you know, today you know you can't do it all yourself. You know, uh, there are Leo constellations which which are being put up. Each and every constellation is talking about an investment of four to five billion dollars, which you can't make. You know, as a single company, you know, based in India, so you need to collaborate, and that's that's if if you don't, you know, uh, are part of these constellations, you'll you'll just miss miss the bus. And from a satellite operator, let's all keep in mind that the satellite operator, you know, takes about you know four to five years to you know from the drawing board to getting a satellite up in the sky. Uh, but after then, you know, somebody decides to contract only for a two-year period and the three three-year period, it's it's not going to work. So. Uh, what will they do with that capacity over the country? You know, for the balance 12-year period, it's it's a tough business case. Uh, so they want direct contracting. They don't want to go through the government with all these restrictions. You know, uh, they want to be able to pre-book capacity. So these are you know definitely of in you know interest. And so these are the problems. So which we will you know discuss uh, later. But these are you know I'm throwing open. Uh, some of the issues which you know the government has to urgently address you know in in uh, revamping the policy next please sure, that's yeah end. sure uh, yeah thank you so much uh, for giving that overview um, we at nsr produce data and we we are seeing from 2020 to 2029 hts capacity demand would increase from 77 gbps to 3.3 terabit per second so it's an exponential increase in capacity. Of course, the demand is there, but uh, the question hangs, how do we unlock that demand from, from a policy perspective? Thanks for your points there. Uh, so a quick question. Um, we've, we've seen uh, a policy paralysis for a long time. Um, no answers in C band, KU band, KA band. Um, if we could come, and most of this broadband capacity needs to be unlocked from KA band, if I understand. What are your thoughts on uh, the road ahead? Uh, what should be the point that perhaps the government and the industry should take, come on a discussion together and go through with it? Well, this time around, after the announcement from the finance minister, there's been a, a flurry of activities you know, which have happened, uh, but uh, nothing concluded at this point of time. But, but a lot of things have been said. Uh, so a couple of key things uh, you know, that comes to my mind is, uh, so today, ISRO uh, or DOS, you know, I keep getting mixed up with these two, uh, you know, different uh, terminologies. So uh, they, you know, all of us recognize there's a conflict of interest. You know, uh, they, they are, you know, the licensor, they are the service provider, they are the regulator themselves, all of it, you know, rolled into one. And most often that, you know, definitely, you know, there are conflicts uh, of interest. I would draw a parallel, you know, from, uh, for example, the state-owned PTT, which is BSNL, or uh, the, in the airlines, you know, you have Air India as a, as a, as a you know, a national airline. So these, you know, do not take monopolistic approaches. So they, you know, own their own assets. They go and compete out in the market. Yes, they have a social responsibility. They provide, you know, services into those areas which no private player wants to go. Uh, but they also compete you know, in the open market with the same terms and conditions as that of a private player. So I, I strongly feel, you know, uh, and you know, when the government is in the business of doing business, you know, it is, uh, it's, an, it's a lot tricky. So somewhere I strongly feel you know, the Department of Space has to uh, uh, you know, kind of uh, move their assets or demarket their assets for commercial SATCOM and have to move it to, uh, or you know, in totality, have to move it to uh, either Antrix Corporation or the new Avtar, uh, New Space India Limited, and let those organizations behave like a BSNL or Air India, and you know, contract capacity with you know uh, the users. Uh, secondly, for the private players, you know, it is important. You know, uh, uh, policy, you know, uh, certainty has to exist. And the third important part is if the you know 
government has come up with a space policy, uh, sorry, a SATCOM policy, which envisages the role of private players through an Indian satellite system. And it has been there since 2000, you know, we are talking about 20 years now. Why has not a single company got a license to, you know, put up a satellite from Indian, you know, soil? Uh, so is, is it, you know, lack of uh, uh, intent from the industry or is it lack of motivation from the government? Uh, you know, I'll, I'll leave it to the audience to judge that. But, you know, definitely the government has to play a catalyzing role uh, in making sure that the you know, private industry is able to leverage that policy and uh, licenses are granted. Fair point, Krishna. Um, even after 20 years, not a single company has gotten the license to do that. Um, before we go to the next topic, I want to take Raji's point of view here. Um, These are very valid points. The business case definitely exists. The demand is there. So why aren't we able to do it? Raji, from a security perspective, from an ISRO, the way it stands uh, within, uh, as an organization within India. What do you think? What are they thinking uh, around these topics? No, I think from, if you look at purely from an ISRO perspective, they do not have an incentive to open up the sector. They really enjoy the monotony, uh, the, uh, sort of uh, the, being the sole player, supplying to the entire country's demands. They enjoy that privileged position in a sense. So if, if you look at it that perspective, from that perspective, there is no incentive for them to open up and bring in competition. Therefore, I believe that it has to be a top-driven uh, approach. The political leadership has to take up ownership of the space sector and do the uh, required reforms because otherwise you are not going to see uh, sort of a level playing field for the private sector to engage as, a, as an active stakeholder. Uh, <clears throat> And I think Krishna has given uh, ample examples, both from the airline as well as the telecom sector. Uh, you bring in competition that also makes the organization a lot more efficient. Uh, I agree. I, I can say that ISRO has been one of the rare public sector units that has done India well. But at the same time, the growing demands, whether it is for your communication, whether it's for your weather forecasting, uh, security and defense requirements, there is a, a greater requirement which is not being met by the ISRO alone today. Uh, that cannot be met by this row. There is a huge capacity deficit and sooner than later, I think the previous chairman to some extent had uh, acknowledged this and started very gradual opening up of the sector to a select number of players. But here the key thing is private sector is not your enemy. And I think that approach, that mindset change has to come. And I think that's something uh, that will not be particularly entertained by the ISRO on its own. It has to be taken away. Even in uh, relation to the announcement made by the finance minister, uh, ISRO is not particularly excited about it because you could see the unexcited uh, tweet from them saying that, okay, we will work with whatever government policies come about in a sense. So they are not driven. They are not, they don't have an incentive to change the rules of the game. They are enjoying the mono monopoly and they do enjoy that privileged position. So unless it is a political decision taken by the uh, uh, Modi government or the government at the central level, you are not going to see much change. But there is a sizable talent both within the country and also from uh, uh, buying data from outside. And those are possibilities that absolutely has to be uh, exploited given the kind of growing uh, requirements in the security and civilian sectors in India. Thank you so much for those points, Raji. Incentive and political reasons uh, yeah. are the two words I'm going to take away from here. If somebody can give incentive to ISRO and sort of come to the table with, the, with those right um, uh, negotiations, perhaps. Uh, without going further ahead on SATCOM, let's dive a little bit into EO with Pratik. Pratik, there has been a uh, recent change where uh, finance minister has suggested that you could use foreign data uh, which was not possible before. What are your views on that? And what are the implications uh, that we might see on this sector? Would we see new startups? Would we see new problems being solved? Uh, what do you think? Thanks, Gagan. Uh, see, the announcement by Finance Minister uh, has been uh, vague. Uh, it's still not clear uh, as to how the procurement of foreign Earth observation data would be made by let's say Indian companies. But let me give a background of uh, uh, the entire policy conundrum uh, of remote sensing that uh, that is today followed in India. It's, it's called the Remote Sensing Data Policy, established in 2011. 
the interesting part about this policy is that it has concentrated the power and function of aggregating and distributing all your data in the hands of national remote sensing center a unit of isro uh, and for high resolution images uh, they have constituted a committee called high resolution image committee now uh, this mechanism currently suffers from lack of uh, transparency it avoids uh, providing any measure of predictability on the success of obtaining the eo data uh, from nrsc or from the high resolution committee so whatever uh, recommendation that the finance minister has made uh, they should be addressing the the specific issues around uh, the the transparency uh, the the speed at which you are able to get and, and the fact that it should be fair uh the distribution of the data should be fair and uh, i understand the the background of keeping such a uh, such a policy which is definitely not in line with the current market realities uh, was uh, the the aspect around national security but funnily enough uh, even uh, uh, the national security concerns uh, are are uh, not uh, met in the current uh, policy regime so uh, it what it means for for companies like uh, satshare which is into the downstream part of the value chain is that you have to innovate around the corporate structures uh, you know entities in india entities outside of india uh, just to uh, you know overcome the challenges around procurement uh, uh, and and uh, also distribution of uh, insights the the one thing which uh, uh, we are hoping uh, like when i say we i'm speaking of the industry which is user base of uh, tabulation data uh, is that one uh, the the aspect of social good through this data would be given equal importance to the national uh, security uh, it because in the current format the policy unreasonably assumes a level of distrust with the private sector that is unsupported by either experience uh, or uh, by uh, actual you know facts so uh, in the event of uh, uh, the the certain disasters and and a lot of uh, uh work that is going into remote monitoring capabilities especially during uh, the covid lockdown i think uh, uh we are looking forward to uh, you know widespread structural reforms if i must say that from the finance ministry uh, especially on uh, earth observation uh, data uh, usage uh, procurement uh, and uh, also distribution i hope that uh, gives you slightly broad answer to the question absolutely usage procurement and downstream uh, deployment makes sense um you mentioned two very important points that is social good on one hand how can we use this data to determine agricultural yield infrastructure mapping uh, multiple applications for earth observation and on the other side is national security do we use a national imagery or do we use foreign imagery rajiv coming to you what do you think of this debate um what is is there a solution in hand do we already have a solution in hand because of which the finance minister suggested such or do you think implementation is quite far away no i think uh, national security is often used as a nice cover to kind of keep uh, keep certain players out and i think that's always been the case when it comes to some of the sensitive sectors whether it is deep space or atomic energy and so on and so forth but i think that's uh, that's an easy blanket ban is always an easy approach and i think that uh, that needs to change clearly that has to be changed uh, and again recognize the uh, key role that the private sector can play in strengthening india's growth story because today if in india has to look at its space policy and program and how it how competitive it is it has to be looked at two from two perspectives one is the commercial perspective including the indian domestic context but also the global commercial space market and i think that's a sizable market that india is not really tapping on into second of course is the national security requirements within india and how that capacity is being uh, capacity deficit that is uh, that problem is being addressed and without the private sector you are not going to go very far uh, but i i, I agree that there is sensitivity to kind of opening up to the private sector like i said private sector is not the enemy but so engaging the private sector you still can do it and when you are doing certain strategic sectors you can bring in certain regulator and that's where uh, the uh, announcements are been great but i think there has to be a follow up legal regime and a regulatory framework that would uh, set clear benchmarks in terms of how to engage the private sector um, 
uh, even in strategic sectors, how you might kind of keep certain, there could be certain guidance from the national um, uh, organization, central organization, but private sector cannot be kept out under the cover of, uh, under the garb of national security. That's been the easy approach. Uh, and I think that's, uh, therefore, even as the announcements have been pretty good, the thing implementation, execution of this announcement is the key. And what kind of regulatory framework, what are the enabling policies that are going to be um, developed by the government? And I think that's the, that's that's a million dollar question that everybody is waiting because I spoke to a lot of private sector folks after the announcement was made. There is no particular excitement uh, on this. Uh, everybody has a wait and watch approach because we have been hearing this private sector inc incorporating them as an active stakeholder for quite some time, but not seen the appropriate regulatory or legal framework to give them an enabling role in a sense. And I think to a large extent, uh, our Department of Space, they have a gatekeeper um, kind of a role. And I think that's the mindset change. And to that extent, I'm happy that the political leadership has taken the lead, at least the first step, first baby step in making some uh, bold announcements, but that has to be now followed up with um, uh, with the things on the ground, uh, uh, actual progress on the ground in terms of enabling frameworks, regulatory frameworks. Totally makes sense. You put out two very important points. One is the need of a uh, governance the law. So I would say maybe a national space law for that matter. And right. second is the execution on the ground. Coming to the former, I think these, a lot of actors have been really trying to get a law in place, right? Yep. It's, it's been a few years. Where do we stand there? If you could perhaps give us a, a scenario to it. No, I think that the need for a comprehensive space policy has been talked about for a very long time. I interact with the different stakeholders, including the Army and uh, Air Force and so on and so forth. And several rounds of, uh, you know, this um, space policy document has been gone around these organizations, uh, but we are yet to see any final uh, sort of a, a pathway towards that. Uh, it's not very clear, uh, but uh, meanwhile, you had the uh, commerce, uh, uh, the uh, the bill to um, sort of encourage or engage the commercial uh, players. Again, uh, that also there are problems in that particular framework because that's in a, since, since uh, it, it still has a very outsourcing kind of a model, uh, which has been the case how ISRO has dealt with or worked with uh, organization, institutions like uh, the LNT, uh, Godrej and so on and so forth. But that model, has, that model is not capable of addressing the current and the growing requirements uh, within the space sector. And I think that policy has to change. But the need for an overarching policy is very very real and uh, I don't think the ISRO can really uh, come out with a policy of that kind because ISRO will be limited uh, given that they are a civil space organization and therefore it is going to be limited in nature. So ideally this has to come from the prime minister's office or the ministry of external affairs or even or the, or the parliament of India that those three organizations, especially the parliament of India or the uh, PMO can have a comprehensive overarching policy framework put in place. Uh, and uh, that that should be the way, uh, way ahead in a sense. Makes sense. Many thanks. For that, I'll come to Krishna now. Raji mentioned execution. Uh, even if the certain policies have come out, say ISP policy came out last year, and now we are seeing manufacturing open up. If you were in the shoes, what would be your five steps of executing certain policies? Yeah, I think first and foremost, uh, a lot of, uh, you know, uh, policy formation and uh, you know uh, laying the steps for that implementation you know uh, we can draw a parallel from the telecom uh, you know side uh, i think you know uh, the department of telecom has a very well laid out plan uh, of you know policy formation and execution uh, there is a great organization which is telecom regulatory authority of india Today, which not not only formulates policies for uh, telecommunications, but it also formulates policies for the broadcasting sector. Uh, they go through a very detailed, uh, you know, consultation mechanism with the stakeholders, come up with a policy framework, come up with recommendations, and of course, you know, it is not obligatory on the respective department to follow those recommendations. But at least, uh, you get a very neutral. Uh, you know, policy, which is, you know, consulted very well. Uh, all the stakeholders are, views are taken into account and certain recommendations come out. So I don't think there is, it makes any sense in, you know, in kind of reinventing that wheel. 
or setting up a new mechanism of uh, such a consultative effort. So if the Telecom Regulatory Authority of India can do that for telecommunications, it can do for broadcasting, why not for the space sector as well? So uh, I, maybe not for the entire space sector, but at least for the SATCOM, uh, which is uh, entirely dependent on telecommunications and broadcasting. Uh, so definitely Telecom Regulatory Authority of India can play that role. And in the past, uh, in a lot of associated, you know, uh, uh, consultation work that they have done, they have brought out these issues of, you know, open skies, or they have brought out these issues of what policy should ISRO follow. Uh, but I, I, again, you know, uh, so it's, it's more that ISRO does not have a mandate, you know, to follow those recommendations. But as long as that is put in place, so you have a ready-made mechanism uh, available. Uh, because I don't think anybody, you know, can claim that, you know, they are they have all the knowledge to understand what the uh, stakeholders need and, you know, can formulate a policy and implement it, you know, uh, without uh, or rather satisfying even 70 to 80 percent of what the needs of each stakeholders uh, stakeholder is. So I don't think that's going to happen. So unless otherwise you give it to a uh, kind of a neutral body like that, uh, which is already in place, which al already has done such work. So that that would be the quickest way to, you know, kind of implement uh, something like this. Right, right. So there's a clear need for collaboration, perhaps, if I understand from uh, the regulatory authority, um, the telecom department, uh, ANCREC, uh, or the or the new organization uh, coming together and really feeling out all the stakeholders. What do we need? How do we go ahead from here? Um, and again, in this particular collaboration, and this is a question to all the panelists now. Um, where do you see where, where do you see the lack? Like why where do you see government not stepping forward? It is is it. Uh, not giving up the orbital slots or frequency? Is it that? Um, is it just uh, there is no sheer intent within the organization to do so? Or is there a misunderstanding of some sort which uh, players on both sides are not able to solve? Pick up. Uh, uh, you want me, uh, on you want me to go first? Yeah, sure. sure, sure, sure. sure. Yeah, so uh, definitely, I think it's a question of mandate. Uh, you know, so once the, uh, ISRO has a mandate to sell all the capacity that they produce, obviously they're going to try and do every trick possible. I mean, if, if uh, anybody was a commercial organization and they were in their position, you know, they would have done the same. On top of it, you know, you have agencies like, you know, the audit agencies and you know, uh, the controller and uh, auditor general. So they come up with all sorts of questions that when you have your own capacity, uh, why have you taken foreign capacity and, you know, millions of such questions. So uh, definitely, so that mandate has to change. Uh, I'll, I'll again draw a parallel. I mean, today uh, in the uh, satellite sector, uh, you know, what I have collected as statistics is today, uh, the commercial satcom is just 37% of the entire, you know, satellite uh, horizon, right? So uh, the balance 63% is, is all the strategic uses that we are talking about. Uh, you know, it could be uh, earth exploration. It, it could be a variety of things. And I think most of the governments have picked up this 37% and they have kind of opened that, uh, you know, to the private sector uh, as a first go. And then they have looked at, you know, the balance 63%. So I think that's a good model to follow. Uh, definitely uh, in India as well. So uh, possibly, you know, so this is a thing that, so somewhere ISRO has been, has to be told that maybe apart from the government's own use, they need not produce satellite capacity, you know, apart from proving their capability, I don't think, or, you know, uh, they don't need to build capacity and, you know, they don't need to have a mandate to, uh, or be forced to sell that capacity and, you know, uh, resorting to this mechanism. I think that, that mandate, first of all, has to change. Right, right. So that, yeah. then, if I if I may uh, also add to uh, the points made by Krishna and also Rajiv, uh, there are two very specific things uh, that struck me. One is uh, the incentive aspect, which Rajiv mentioned about, and the other one is the user base uh, aspect, which uh, uh, Krishna has uh, dis uh, mentioned. Now, um, if you look at uh, uh, any kind of policy uh, mechanism that is built, uh, 
firstly the government needs to have incentive what is the incentive uh, if someone like department of space is going to be building the policy along with ministry of law they need to know what is in it for them and that what is in it for them will only come when you have a you know user workshop or at least aggregation of requirements from different users whether it's satcom or eo right uh, you need to you need, we are probably not hitting uh, at the right places when we are discussing about policy because i have been doing this for the last 5 years uh, raji has been doing this for probably more okay and krishna even more so uh, what what is it that the uh, uh, government wants to hear they want to hear how can we create more jobs how can we create uh, can, how can we assist in some of the pro- programs on national development how are we uh, what are the uh, you know unit economics uh, around it uh, in, in terms of satcom it's pretty clear when when we are looking at the last mile connectivity uh, what is how does uh, you know satcom uh, play a role in digital india but when it comes to something like eo uh, it's so diverse that people can't even imagine there so perhaps uh, uh, perhaps the, the way to involve that would be to clearly etch out uh, if we are uh, you know going to have going to support private small satellite or satellite or launch vehicle companies to be uh, you know uh, who have to build it in india what is in it for them uh, how and what is it for the government how many jobs can it create what is the manufacturing value addition uh, uh, increment that we have uh, due to establishment of something like this uh, how do we encourage this encouraging does not mean give some grant make some uh, you know photo shoots and do some media encouragement means uh, giving proper tax rebates of clear predictable policy regime right so uh, and then comes the aspect of uh, the, the the downstream uh, application user base so for every rupee which is invested in a earth observation satellite what is the multiplier that you are getting from the data spread across the agriculture infrastructure policy making transportation all kinds of value chain right so that kind of study only pe- people are not doing and uh, we are speaking of uh, building a policy which is obviously uh, it doesn't make sense right so <clears throat> that's that's something which uh, uh i believe i don't know maybe raji you can comment uh, uh, if any initiatives like this have been taken up uh, in delhi since the national space law uh, a draft was made and then shelved <laughs> unceremoniously absolutely no i think uh, uh, you br- bring in some of the right questions uh, uh, pratip uh, whether in terms of the jobs created and so on and so but i think uh, like uh, uh, like i said uh, this is uh, not going to be done by the isro they don't have an incentive they don't have any interest in expanding the sector and so uh, and therefore i believe and i that's say something i said earlier that the political leadership has a, has a much better comprehensive more comprehensive view of what the nation should be looking like by 2030 whatever whatever and what is it that i need to do within the space sector and within the space sector okay this is what i need to do in the communication this is what i need to do in the sector security and so on and so forth um, so that political leadership can have that broader more comprehensive perspective and therefore they can demand expanding the number of stakeholders in this area and i think expanding the number of stakeholders also will ensure a somewhat more transparent and better accountability uh, and regulatory practices and certain amount of predictability in how that can happen and i think this has been something completely missing and uh, krishna brought out very clearly the promotion commercialization regulatory functions all rolled into one undertaken by the same agency it's not a healthy uh, a healthy approach to continue and i think that's something that we need to um, change uh, see a big change in a sense there are also other issues on the part of apprehension on the part of the private sector to some of the especially these private uh, smaller companies uh, who are wanting to uh, get a share of the pie uh, they have problem with sharing of the intellectual property for certain products that are developed by them exclusively and isro taking the entire intellectual property rights and i think that's again something that needs to uh, be talked about and uh, um, uh, addressed by the government uh, as when they are currently talking about the reforms in a sense uh, <clears throat> so if isro is serious about partnering with the private sector and or the government is serious about partnering with the private sector and give them an active uh, level playing field and give them an active stakeholder position it has to spell out the requirements and select the best available in the market otherwise there is just no way that you can actually enable a level playing field it will remain simply a lip service uh, other in 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 other other terms so some of the key points independent regulator i think that's absolutely key and if you are interested uh, you have 
have to give out your specific uh, requirements and select the best in the market. Thank you, Thank you for that, Steve and Raji. Uh, that covers a lot on the incentives, um, the apprehensions on both sides. Uh, IP sharing law, perhaps that's a, that's a very crucial point that you've mentioned. Uh, so, you mentioned the multiplier study is not happening. Maybe if such a study happened and we know what is the output from one rupee or one dollar of input, uh, maybe that path would be much, uh, would be of less friction. Uh, but still, I can't help but think, what else are we missing? Is, is it just the multipliers or is it just uh, the sheer political will uh, to uh, dissect? Uh, a company who's a regulator, who's a manufacturer, who's a platform player, uh, and uh, a government entity. Uh, mo moving ahead uh, from this discussion, we've just received a poll. Uh, we asked our audience, are the recent updates in Indian space policy a pressure due to COVID-19? 55% uh, have answered no. They have been anticipated. Private sector has been demanding unrestricted access to platform market and use of your data. 45% have said yes, there seems to be an urgency now in boosting the private sector to boost the economy in the short medium term. Um, I want to throw this question to our panelists as well. Uh, what is your opinion, uh, starting from Raji, and uh, do, do you see a long-term mindset change now that COVID has happened? We see the sector as uh, a business that can boost the economy, and the demand is for sure there. You've seen that. Uh, what are your opinions? No, I think uh, I'm not entirely optimistic. There is a certain amount of uh, optimism in the air, but it's, uh, it's exactly, it depends on the kind of implementation that you see. And there is going to be quite a bit of resistance from the technocrats and the scientific bureaucracy uh, of the country. So how the government is able to push through. Uh, government certainly is interested in seeing some big and bold reforms uh, uh, in, in all the different, in many, several different sectors. Uh, and they want to be really bold because they want to be something uh, bigger than what happened happened in the 90s and is in the beginning of the 90s with the liberalization in a sense. So there is certain amount of poss certain possibilities that it would uh, go an extra mile in kind of uh, making certain, uh, taking some important steps in that regard. Uh, but I don't know whether we'll go all the way to create a private sector, that ecosystem that is uh, conducive for the private sector to function. ISRO uh, alone cannot be uh, good. We need Jeff Bezos, we need uh, um, Elon Musk, SpaceX, and uh, Blue Origin, and all of that to come about in India. And how do we that make that happen? I think uh, it's uh, still not very clear that ISRO is willing to give away entirely. ISRO has been compelled to work with certain um, uh, certain uh, private sectors. More small and medium-sized enterprises, but we have not seen a very enthusiastic response from them uh, uh, in, in terms of inviting private sector as an, uh, in, in, uh, as an active player. Uh, they do continue to have that mindset of looking at the private sector as somebody uh, not having the national interest that they are going to be driven by profit alone and so on and so forth. You can, they may have, a, yeah, they are not running a charity, sure. Uh, they could have profit-driven uh, motivations driving their businesses, of course, but then if if they are going to be in the strategic sector, you can have certain regulations in place and therefore the importance of the kind of regulatory framework that is going to be done after this uh, initial announcements from last month. Right. Makes sense. Because if you um, look at the, yeah, so sorry. No, so if you look at the, uh, relatively India has enjoyed uh, a sort of a cost advantage, the reliability of its launch vehicles and so on and so on. But look at the overall share of uh, our share in the global commercial market. We are just about 2% of the, at about 7 billion. That's, you know, that, that says a lot about the lacunas that con the continues to, uh, the uh, problems that continues to suffer the space sector, whether in terms of the launch infrastructure, the number of launches we undertake, uh, and the amount of uh, data that we can also provide. So there are serious uh, deficiencies on the part of ISRO, even if they have done us so well and proud so far, there are deficiencies that must be acknowledged and addressed uh, in a priority uh, fashion from the political leadership, from their side in a sense. Very, very fair point, um, very relevant. And uh, I want to touch upon a sector that we haven't really dived into, manufacturing. So what I hear from the finance minister is startups, businesses, system integrators will be able to use assembly, integration, and testing facilities. And there would be a system integrator sort of an approach for at least the PSLV vehicle file preliminary understand. 
Um, what is your take on that? I'll start with Krishna here on this. And uh, do you see this fully happening? Do you see PSLB getting fully privatized or satellite companies coming in and taking the entire mandate anytime soon? If yes, what's the timeline of uh, other opinions? Uh, okay, so that's, I mean, this is not my area of expertise. So I'm, I'm, I'm just, it's, it's going to be a, a wild guess for me. So uh, I, I strongly feel that, you know, that's, uh, that's a good move, but, you know, you can't just limit it to the technology that we already have, uh, you know, so you should, you know, unless another, otherwise we allow the private sector to really go out and make technology, you know, types with other countries and other companies and other countries uh, and, uh, you know, be able to bring some of the technology here, uh, you know, and the investments along with it. Uh, it makes little sense. Uh, so you, you know, otherwise, what you are saying is, uh, you know, as government, you know, or as ISRO, I, I will decide in the technology. Uh, I will, you know, be limited to my capabilities, and, you know, you just can leverage whatever I produce. You know, I'm willing to take on your services as as an add-on, uh, and help me uh, achieve my goal. That alone is, you know, clearly not good enough in my opinion. Uh, I think you know the public, I mean, private sector has to be given a much more free hand uh, in 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 you know achieving some of it by by their own means. And I I think uh, definitely you know the private sector will do a good job as it has done in all other sectors. Uh, I don't think we should put such a restriction on the private sector as far as manufacturing goes. Understood. Understood. Uh, Pradeep, you want to take a stab at it? Uh, you were the shot before. How easy or hard it is for a private player to come and integrate? <laughs> uh, I guess uh, half of that time would uh, go around, uh, you know, getting the permissions from CIS. <laughs> so, so uh, on a on a serious note, uh, see again uh, this this entire aspect of uh, uh, is like the way in which it's uh, framed that you can come and uh, integrate uh, uh, in our facility. Uh, what if we don't want to integrate in the facility? What if the, for the private uh, company, uh, they have uh, they have certain newer uh, manufacturing methods like additive manufacturing, etc. That is not supported by ISRO. Does that mean uh, these these companies won't be supported? So uh, in in instead of uh, fueling innovation, uh, because space technology is like the, the pinnacle, which which from where innovations across sectors uh, are are developed. Uh, ISRO is still seeing it from a point of a system integrator. Okay, uh, it's it's not like a version 2.0 of industrial uh, participation uh, because ISRO does keep saying 80% of our parts etc is coming from uh, uh, is, is you know uh, is coming from industry and it's all indigenous. Uh, I mean I won't get into details, but uh, there are quite a lot of basic things that are coming from France and Germany, uh, and uh, so so uh, even even uh, uh, if we take that approach and say we have uh, uh, helped the industry, you're not helping the industry, you're actually pushing it back 10 years further. Uh, now, the question of why should the government even uh, uh, listen to private players and not ISRO? Because ISRO will always try to protect uh, its interests, right? They would want the entire industry to grow around them, which is fine. You know, there is no problem around it, but it should be conducive. It should be conducive in the sense that... Uh, um, it, it should uh, have clear uh, terms of usage, commercial terms, IP, IP terms, if there is a technology transfer, which is missing, right? Exactly. This ISRO and ISRO and law doesn't go together today, uh, I mean, or forever. <laughs> so uh, one of the ways to make the government, uh, uh, you know, understand the, the need for, for such kind of growth or policy to, uh, policies to uh, help private sector grow is developing a critical mass beyond the private space sector people. Now, just in India, uh, everyone knows uh, each other among the private space uh, you know, uh, players uh, by face, right? Uh, but what if uh, the finance ministry or commerce ministry is able to hear about uh, the need for more uh, uh, agile data, uh, agile services uh, from, from transportation ministry, from smart cities, from water department, etc., etc., right? So that develops a critical mass. Uh, that is something which, uh, uh, so which has to be done. Uh, 
and when we say that there is demand when you mentioned about the demand on the due to covid demand has always been there but it's latent you have someone has to go and develop the demand uh, some of the private companies like us have taken the pain to develop the demand in earth observation and analytics space uh, but uh, similarly uh, in in communication you're losing you there in navigation uh, you're breaking down okay uh, can you hear me now can you hear me now yep yep uh, yeah okay so i'll just uh, wrap up with saying that uh, some of the uh, uh, this market demand creation demand is always latent for this kind of uh, satellite services you have to actually show the value uh, for showing the value some people have to take the pain if the government can create a sandbox kind of environment where you can, when you have private uh, players competing with isro's uh, services whether it's geospatial services or satellite services uh, then then you have a level playing field and then you have a transparent independent you know uh, uh, committee which is uh, able to see the uh, see the impact it can have uh, if uh, it it meaning the the uh, development of a private space ecosystem can have on the entire country uh, so today we don't have the leverage to go and you know tell uh, the government or advise the government that hey look uh, you can do this and that and the question will be like have do we have we seen such value before you know uh, are we are we just uh, doing lip service so it's a two way street not just isro but uh, the private sector also has to uh, you know stand up and uh, show this uh, uh, show the value of the our of our services uh, in order to have a level playing field uh, with with isro when it comes to advising the government on what should be done and what should not be done I'm, I'm so sorry, uh, folks out there. I lost my connection for 30 seconds. Uh, but for this well-spoken uh, answer, I want to uh, go towards the end of the webinar. There are a few obvious questions that are coming up. But before that, there is a key um, question that I want to ask to Raji, uh, which is happening uh, towards our northern border, the India-China conflict. And how do you think with uh, that conflict happening? um would a certain space or a military policy around eo or satcom change what are the needs that would populate into the policy making um no i would address this in some uh, slightly uh, yeah i would uh, address this in a slightly broader fashion i think uh, there is clearly uh, a much serious competition that is picking up at every level whether it is in terms of the geopolitical tensions on to, uh, on earth or but that's also kind of spreading very rapidly into the outer space domain forcing india to take certain steps um and uh, as a sort of a matching up to certain capabilities that exist and i think these fall uh, well within the for instance space security sector for instance when it uh, whether india's demonstration of an anti satellite capability or even developing other counter space capabilities efforts to develop certain counter space capabilities all are geared towards and and the uh, competition with china is not going to go away and i think that competition has just got picked up a lot and become a lot more strategic and i think some of us have been writing on this thing for a long time saying that on on your le on your left hand side you have a problem on your western uh, on your western front uh, but that's more of a nuisance but what you have on the on your uh, on the eastern front the northern uh, front is a much more much longer term a strategic threat and i think that had to be addressed in an equal fashion and that competition and race is also spreading to outer space outer space is no more immune to the uh, kind of competition that's playing out on earth um, so therefore i there are a couple of if you have to relate to some of the commercial Commercial um, sort of uh, industry perspective. One thing I would say is, for instance, the strengthening the role of the private sector. Why it is important, even in the India-China context, uh, private sector was earlier a purely Western phenomena in the U.S. and other European countries. But that's uh, changing very rapidly in the case of Asia as well. The number of startups, for instance, in China is in uh, several hundreds. And unless India is able to build up its capability involving the private sector and create and uh, augment the Indian space power. Indian space capabilities, we are going to lose the game, both in terms of meeting our own requirements, but also we are going to be losing the global commercial market share in a sense, which is already fairly low. But uh, China is a fast competitor, uh, competitor that in that segment as well. 
so we need to be mindful of these uh, these implications and therefore take appropriate steps and the first and foremost there is a greater recognition i can see uh, of the uh, the role of uh, the private sector there is that acknowledgement has come through at some level but unless that that is followed up with appropriate uh, so the right regulatory framework and a legal regime uh, we will not uh, we, we will lose the game in a sense we are not going to make uh, take advantage of the uh, advantages that uh, we have uh, enjoyed in a sense The very valid points, Raji, and uh, innovate is a crutch to both the government and the private sector to jump in and uh, really innovate this time rather than just uh, adopt technology. Fair point. Um, coming to the end, um, I want to understand our wish list from each of the panelists. What would they want uh, the industry to go, the policy to go in the next two years, perhaps? Um, I will start with uh, Pratip, then Krishna, and then Raji. Uh, okay, so I will uh, probably uh, speak from a geospatial perspective. Uh, Krishna is uh, uh, available, so he can speak on that SATCOM aspect. Uh, so, uh, in terms of uh, wish list, uh, I believe uh, from a geospatial uh, uh, perspective, uh, the entire aspect of uh, buying data. Uh, and also uh, the freedom to uh, launch, uh, build and launch Earth observation satellites from India. It starts from there, you know, the freedom to build and launch satellites uh, and also the policy uh, clarity on the, the communication link uh, between the satellite launched uh, uh, and the ground station, which is again uh, quite hazy. Uh, that should be established uh, first and foremost. Uh, second is the entire procurement uh, of uh, data uh, should be deregularized uh, from you know a single point source like NRSC, uh, where any company, any satellite operator who can provide the data and any buyer uh, from, from in any Indian company can directly interact and do the transactions with the entire uh, uh, thing, you know being under the, the regulation uh, of, of which are which are com which are market specific like which are very uh, also market specific which are uh, more closer to the global markets and there is already a lot of uh, uh, precedents to look up to like the land remote sensing uh, uh, policy act of the us in 1992 that led to the creation of uh, giants like maxar uh, who who today are the largest uh, uh, you know uh, the earth observation company in the world by uh, a privately held company so uh, that these two aspects both on the upstream and the downstream downstream being the procurement uh, policy of the data uh, and the upstream being the the uh, creation of earth observation assets creation launching and communication with earth observation assets from india uh, is something that uh, i hope uh, the government can address uh, in their uh, uh, announcements on the Indian space policy. Thank you, Pratip. Um, over to you, Krishna. Your wish list. Uh, yeah, I, I have a rather long list, but I'll, you know, in the interest of time, I'll just uh, uh, talk about, you know, a couple of the, uh, you know, priority points. Uh, so definitely, uh, you know, so we have to look at it at a short to medium uh, approach and a, and a little long term. Uh, in the short to medium term, definitely, uh, you know, in terms of uh, regulatory certainty uh, and, you know, uh, it's end of the day, you know, uh, I think, you know, there's a licensing framework in which DOT is issuing licenses. So from a, a, a satellite perspective, you know, so it is, uh, DOS is just yet another satellite provider. I've already, I've always said that. There's already a very well laid out mechanism for coordination of satellites as per the ITU principles. So nothing needs to be done in that area. I think what nearly really uh, needs to be done is there is a buyer of capacity, there's a seller of capacity. Uh, you know, the government should just allow these two people to come and, you know, uh, uh, decide for themselves what's good for them and how do they want to do business rather than over-regulating and trying to get into this value chain and uh, messing it up, you know. So that's that's clearly, you know, my first uh, wish list. Um, 
apart from this you know if you know we i did talk about the satcom policy and be able to you know if the uh, government is very keen on building up a domestic sector uh, taking the help of the private sector so definitely you know it is for the government uh, interest uh, you know to definitely allow uh, players to be in the indian satellite system uh, if there are five or six applications that i you know we keep hearing you know at least clear some of them or you know be an enabler uh, in that direction so that's uh, clearly the second uh, wish list uh, you know i would talk about and of course the third you know uh, wish list is uh, for the government you know what's in it for the government so the digital india program uh, through the bharat net you know has fell short you know in uh, all its objectives you know of providing connectivity to all the gps or gram panchayats uh, definitely through fiber so satellite is a very very quick enabler so uh, you know look at it seriously there are still about uh, average 30 to 40000 villages which are not going to get connected so satellite is a good medium uh, so definitely that's in the interest of the government and the last one would be that you know it's definitely commercial in nature if the telecom sector by opening up you know brought in about 15 to 16 billion dollars or even more of investment i think the satellite industry is also capable of bringing at least a 5 billion dollar investment so the government is to gain uh, you know in the present covid time when the government is uh, making a lot of expenditure uh, in keeping the citizens safe and you know dealing with the health issues uh, definitely the, the, there has to be money in flow and this can come in the form of fdi uh, through uh, you know by opening up the sector uh, you know big time so the, this is what i i had to say Many thanks, Krishna. Money is on the table. Buy uh, sellers to buy directly. Very, very valid point. Uh, Raji, I come. Let me come to you. At the last. Sure. Thank you. Um, I, I think I'm going to re-emphasize re the talk. Some of the things that I already said, but I think that's the uh, uh, that is re-emphasize the reiterate the importance of those two uh, those couple of issues. One is one and first and foremost is the the need for a comprehensive space policy, which is to be issued from a PMO, MEA, or the Parliament. That is absolutely critical because that will send a message to your own. The certain amount of predictability that is built into that uh, uh, if you have a space policy out in the open, uh, it sends clear message. messages to your investors your friends your force i think that messaging is absolutely important strategic messaging uh, it can be the most effective tool in that regard so i think that has to come out second i think the um, the importance of uh, the key drivers in india space policy and program again like i said it has to be commercial and national security driven objectives i think those two are important drivers uh, commercial it should take care of all of your uh, given the large uh, physical geographical landmass that we are communications all of that are part of it um so commercial and uh, and again here i would say is have specific requirements try and get the best in the market and the, for which there has to be there should there should be clear benchmarks that need to be identified to get the best uh, talent from the market in a sense uh, there is also to uh, learn from the nasa as an example for instance nasa has created and nurtured um, uh, a big company big industries like the boeing but also they have created spacex they have created that space for these two um, uh, size uh, massive uh, entities of that kind isro has done well so far but we need to it is time that we create our own spacex blue origin and boeing in a sense who can act as an independent private sector player autonomous a uh, certain amount of uh, regulatory functions need to come out and that would also kind of create a more level playing field because otherwise despite uh, the uh, cost advantage reliability all of that Uh, india has not really cornered a decent size of the global uh, market as well and india can gain significantly i believe if the isro can come up with uh, the team up with the private sector to make more effective and uh, have a synergistic and an effective approach to gain significantly uh, this of course requires the government to actually act on the announcements that has just made uh, we also need to make uh, the right learn the right lessons from some of the other places for instance china for instance they are planning to launch 50 odd satellites in 2020 and where i was just looking at it and we were planning to do 50 launches over the next couple of next few years and that says a lot about the kind of competitive issues uh, Uh, that uh, unless india becomes more competitive in that regard we are going to lose the game so commercial comprehensive space policy uh, get the best talent from the market put out clear benchmarks for that third 
uh, learn from the best example. One of the best example is the NASA, how they have functioned by incorporating Boeing and uh, SpaceX. They, the NASA's importance has not um, gone away anywhere, has not diminished one bit. So in a sense, ISRO has to become a more competitive and accommodative player. It has to take on the role of a, gate, uh, a facilitator than a gatekeeper. Right. Thank you so much for those points, Saji. They they really uh, really were comprehensive. The kind of lessons we can learn, the kind of incentives um, from NASA, from China, and definite definite comparisons, um, uh, which, which where is intro and India clearly lag. I don't think we will have a time to take all these questions. Uh, generally, most of the questions are around when are these policy change is going to be implemented? When do we see selling in the Indian market? When do we see the role of regulator versus business being separated? Um, if anybody wants to take a stab at it, that's the last question and then we'll wrap it up. Most of the questions are related to SATCOM, so uh, maybe Krishna. <laughs> Uh, no, I think Raji is a better person, but I don't have a sense of the timeline. Uh, you know, I, I was just thinking, should I just log out and log in as just as a participant to hear Raji talk on timelines? No. So. No, I wish I wish we had that kind of a predictability about how Indian uh, space uh, uh, sector is kind of uh, is going to grow and how um, cute they are going to be in enabling a clear uh, space for the private sector. Uh, while there is clear acknowledgement that in ISRO alone cannot be uh, uh, sort of a, a left to fill the all the requirements, whether it's um, you know the sp today's space is no more just about communications, not just about Earth observation and so on and so forth. It it's it's a lot more and the uh, the requirements clearly cannot be met by ISRO alone and they have to encourage the private sector but how quickly this is going to happen is a million dollar question I do not think I have a, a very clear timeline I, but I'm not uh, overly optimistic that uh, it's going to be I think some question came about whether it's two years five years or a few months I think uh, certainly it's five years plus uh, I don't see this see it uh, kind of the an enabling policy framework to happen uh, within the uh, within the next few years, in a sense. Did we lose Gagan? I think uh, I, we have lost. Uh, Jose. Right. Yes, um, I think we did lose Gagan, but I'm here as the backup. Um, uh, fortunately or unfortunately, we're we're out of time. And thank you for taking a stab at that question. Um, so with that, I, I think we, we bid goodbye. Um, excellent panel, uh, very comprehensive once again. Uh, I'm sure there'll be more questions, a follow-up may be required for the conference, but thank you everyone for your time. Thank you APSCC uh, for holding this, uh, this webinar. And uh, thank you for our sponsors and uh, look for the next uh, webinar series. Um, this was quite helpful once again. Um, and uh, Congratulations to all your, your companies, um, to all your entities. And uh, moving forward, we will certainly watch out for further developments in India and how it impacts the globe. So thank you very much. And uh, till the next, till the next panel.